Hi guys, welcome to the latest podcast of Yarn and Black. Tonight I actually have a really great um, guest coming on and one of my favourites, and it's Mariki Hood. Hi, Mariki. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> cool. Um, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm currently on. I'm in Borwin Q on the land of the Rundry people, and I want to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging, and extend that to the Aboriginal viewers that are coming in today and to Mariki herself. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, where to start? It's been an interesting few years, brother. Um, so um, I've been doing music on and off for about 16 years now. Um, originally it was just something to kind of just heal my mind a little bit, um, get creative and as time went on, it uh, turned out I was partially decent at it and I've managed to travel the world with my music. I've met a lot of my idols. I've even managed to collaborate with a few of them um, and on top of recording with them, perform with them, which is amazing. Um, then coupled up with two of the other amazing female artists, um, uh, Lady Latch and Dizzy Dolan. Mm. Um, we were making waves all around the world as well. Um, some of our stuff was being played internationally. Even um, Chuck D gave us a shout out on his radio station in New York. So that was amazing. Um, and Spinderella from um, Salt and Pepper did a shout out with our stuff as well, talking a bit about that. Um, disturbing the peace domestic violence track. So, yes, it's been amazing. It's been awesome. And then last month, we're just kind of getting back from it, actually, about six weeks ago. My apologies, six weeks ago. Um, I was asked to do a collaboration with um, Ronan um, Olin, who has well, is world-renowned for working with artists like Madonna, Stevie Wonder. Um, he'd, yeah, he's been all around the world with his music. Uh, he was on Broadway in New York as well. Um, and we got to collaborate um, for a, a project he felt deeply connected with because uh, his background was Irish. So when The Voice... Um, referendum was going on, you'd be surprised how many people were actually aware of this. Um, but he was he was definitely one of them that had tuned in, saw that was what was kind of going on with Aboriginal community and people and saw a need for a, a song, as all of us do when we're artists. Um, you know, we just... Best way to get our voice out there and make sure it's meaningful and even catchy. Um, it's through music. It gets stuck in their head and it, it relates to the masses and we can manage to get the word, word across really well. So um, I was very blessed to work with him and his production team uh, for song lines as well. So I call Robbie Bundle that helped. I call Brad Brown had been involved. We got, um, we got a few amazing lineups and, and acts that also featured on the track. Um, another young MC who was from the UK and an uh, African American woman who was from New York. I've got to go through and get their names again uh, to help promote their stuff, but they were, yeah, they helped bring the track alive. They basically did everything. I just sprinkled a little bit at the end result there and, and was good to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so from that, I've been working with a couple of other artists, um, not so much in the Aboriginal community as much as I'd hope to be involved. Yeah. Um, guess I'm just kind of taking a bit of a step into more of a worldly view. I like to see music from all angles and perspectives, especially what's going on around the world. Yeah. Um, 
And I'm so blessed and lucky to be in such a diverse, multicultural environment here in Brunswick. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it gives me a chance to kind of, you know, get a little bit more insight of the whole world and what's taking place and being able to, you know, collaborate accordingly with it to raise awareness of other things that are going on. Yeah. When did yeah, you know? Cool. When did you know that you really liked music and you wanted to be an artist? It was music was actually birthed out of a a place of trauma for me. Um, I was dealing with severe post traumatic stress disorder. Um, at a very young age, as I started to get older, the thoughts and paranoia kicked in almost to the point where I was hearing voices and my mind was constantly running, couldn't find anything to calm it or ease it. So music was kind of my saviour. It was literally my medicine. It helped me stay focused. I could see achievement happening in real time. Um, I could plan ahead, I had goals, I could put things in place to block out the voices, I could constantly sort of rehearse and practice what I had just written and keep doing it. And then, you know, <clears throat> next thing I know, I was finishing songs um, and I'd reached out to, you know, beautiful Uncle Puja Edwards and I explained, look, I got a track up, and he was like, well, let's do it. Let's get you on radio. Let's get you on 3CR. I'll do an interview with you, Art, and we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll get that music happening up because, you know, you're really young. You've got a lot to say. A lot of people can relate. Um, and from there I just kept kind of going. It, it helped build up my confidence a lot. Going on stage is probably the closest happiness I feel from being home on country. I just feel really in line to peace almost um, whenever I'm on stage. And I think you can relate it a lot to our, our cultural aspect, um, you know, our song lines, our music. Part of that, you know, traditional education system was always about, hmm, Music it was about art, it was about dance, self-expression, um, learning song lines was through certain songs and chants as well. Um, retaining information was through art, dance, ceremony, law. Uh, so it just, it almost seemed like second nature and it was a really important healing aspect because I... Like music, when you strip it back to its core element, it's it's pure medicine, and it's something that had been around before humans. Um, you know, through the sounds of animals, birds, whales, um, even the planets make that sort of low vibration frequency that you hear from the ditch. That's why the didgeridoo is such a healing tool. It kind of aligns you with all of that frequency and that healing. Um, the only downfall is the industry, the music industry itself can be like a drug mm. um, because you will get your incredible highs. You'll get off stage and all of a sudden you've got everybody asking for your autograph and what are you doing now and let's link up and let's be best mates and you almost get addicted to that sort of high. You want more of it, you crave it, and you you forget that it's just a facade. Sometimes it seems so real, and then you get your really low moments where it's like you're, you know, you'll jump off stage, everything's fine, but then you realise you haven't eaten that day because you've just been going from one sound check to another sound check to another sound check, back to that gig, then back to that gig, then back to that gig. And, I mean, sure, you're getting a bit of money, but you're not going to get that pay until, you know, sometimes months. 
Um, and meanwhile, you can't even afford transport back to where you're staying, like, or you lose your house because you can't afford the rent on the bills. So it is, and then it's kind of when you do hit that rock bottom, you realise once again it's only you that can pick yourself up and pull you out of it. Um, because for most side, you're you're not Mariki Hood, you're Miss Hood. You know, you're Miss Hood, you're all this, you're all that, you get back up, you know, like, oh, you know, you're so deadly, you're this, you're a rapper, you've been around the world a few times, you've done this and that and that with this and your music and you've worked with all the Tupac's Outlaw crew and, you know, you've collaborated with this one and this one and what do you mean you're broke? What do you mean you need a loan? What do you mean you haven't eaten in the last day and a half? What, what do you mean you don't have a place to stay? So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's so interesting to see how it can look from the outside um, because it is about wanting other people to chase their dreams. So you put on this persona that everything is okay, yeah. but at the same time, you're just holding on by a thread. Um, yeah, and I think even in America, that they tend to get paid on the night of their performance or sometimes they'll get half before and then for the rest after the show. Um, but here in Australia, especially with us, you know, I mean, it sounds like a lot of money being told you're going to get two grand for performing for 45 minutes that's awesome hell yeah that's that sounds amazing but no one tells you you're going to be waiting about nine minutes for that money to come through mm. yeah. so it's it's that kind of catch 22 there you know um but it's yeah it's it's definitely been a, a learning journey it's good to see how things work and operate um, but I think the best part about the music industry, though, yeah, is working with other artists because it's it's almost like a family community. We all support each other, and there's been so many times that we can all relate to each other. Like, oh, you've been screwed over by that manager. Me too. Not that manager, but this manager. Or keep your eye out for this person that runs this label because this person will do this and that person will do that. And oh, you were stuffed up by them as well. Yeah, my, my cousin was. Like it's it's amazing how small the industry actually is. Um, yeah. But for the most part, it's always the artists that I find that are the most genuine, caring, heartfelt, beautiful, respectful, talented people. Um, and it's it's amazing that you can kind of collaborate and come together in that. So. Well, you, who are your role models? Um, I've got a few. Um, and they keep kind of changing as time goes on when you grow. But my father was always my number one role model. Um, yeah. My dad, Terry Hood, or Woody. Um, paved the way for a lot of Aboriginal community members, created a lot of job opportunities, created a lot of businesses. Um, but his kindness always shined through. He was the first to give you his last dollar. He was the first person to take his jacket or T-shirt off his back to keep you warm. Um, and we just, they don't make them like they used to. Um, I, as a kid, I couldn't walk down the street without being stopped by one of their uncles or aunties who will ask, you know, who, who's your mob? Who's your father? Who's your mum? And I tell them, and they're like, oh, Tootie. I remember Tootie. Tootie was <laughs> the one that was my first birthday present. Or Tootie was the one that helped me get my first house. Or Tootie was always there to help whenever I was, in prison, I needed to bail out or I needed a place to stay. Or I think he had, yeah, looking at my father and what he had been through as a child because he was part of the stolen generation. He was born 
a low tires mission and he had been through a lot. But to still be so kind and loving to your absolute core, yeah. it's it's it doesn't happen often. And there's a there's a real strength in that. So yeah, he was definitely my, my first role model. Um as time went on in the music industry, it was more, it was international and local. Yeah. Um, loved, loved Tupac, Outlaws, Bone Thugs, Ice Cube, Snoop. Um, those were the rebellious times as well. Every genre had that moment where it was almost like the elders couldn't connect your parents never understood it and you know back in the day it was disco then it was funk rock and roll mm. for us it was hip-hop yeah um so we we gravitated towards that especially with everything that was going on in the community at the time um you know there was still a lot of racism um we weren't so lucky to be raised in such a pres like such a well progressive woke time. We were still very much considered the lowest of the low in the food chain, and uh, you know I remember going to school being teased constantly. Me and my older sister and my little sister, because you know we've got Aboriginal names. That was the first one. I was like, ha, ha, your name's Mariki. How dumb is that? You teach it, the teacher can't even spell your name. You know, like things like that. You know, kids, kids in their ways, but yeah, little things like that kind of stick with you. So gravitating towards hip hop, even though they had their own different dynamics, it was still very relatable. And I think with the things that went on with Native American communities extremely similar to us same with slavery because a lot of us were owned as well um it was you could definitely relate and connect with that movement of giving the grassroots and people without a voice the ability to speak so and then i guess you know growing up i've always been a diehard fan of uncle archie roach um dad showed me his music when i was maybe seven or eight and same with no fixed address colored stone um you know or jimmy little it just kind of grew up with that beautiful music in the background that also connected you to your roots yeah. um yeah so it was a lot of a lot of role models have kind of Come and gone. I still kind of change every now and then, but yeah, I guess my role models nowadays artists like Lady Lash, artists like Dizzy Dolan, yeah, these beautiful girls that have been through hell and back that can get on stage and command the audience in such a beautiful, unique, right. spiritual way. It's <laughs> like some of the things these beautiful strong women have gone through and are still standing and doing amazingly well it's you words don't do it justice on yeah and to be able to collaborate and travel and tour with them it's like dream come true really um so it was, it was awesome um so when did your debut album come out sorry when did your debut album come out so it was, it was the EP that had been released um, and we're still in the process of trying to figure out what the results are going to be from this um, because COVID hit. COVID changed a lot of the landscape of music and how things were done. We've, we've had to learn and figure out how to move forward and we're still kind of picking up some of the pieces but we were making some really big 
you know, big dreams come true. And I know Mike Justice at the moment, he's just had a beautiful baby, I think about six or seven months ago. So our manager of the group, Mike Justice, he's um he's navigating fatherhood at the moment. So <laughs> completely understand what's what that is like i've got a four-year-old son um and a daughter who's going to be 19 in july um and dizzy also just had her first baby girl not that long ago so that's you know congratulations to her beautiful sister girl and you know, if there's anything like her mum she's definitely going to be a strong force to be reckoned very, with very powerful very powerful woman. Yeah, yeah, just beautiful. Um, also, Jessica Melboy got to share the stage and perform with her. That was that was on. Yeah. Um, and you know, she is one of the other female idols that I look up to as well. Um, and I think it's just it says a lot about a person's character when it would make sense for them to shun you or just walk away. They had that kind of power to just be mean or not as appreciative and get away with it. Whereas in my personal experience, Jessica Melboy went above and beyond to make sure all of us were right, you know, not just us as the performers, but, you know, people from the backstage, even the catering service, you know, um, that, that speaks volumes on somebody's character. So, yeah, I do. I do love Sister Girl, and I appreciate her as well. Um, same with the beautiful Brother Boys. Um, you know, Jim Brown Young Warriors. Um, father of my beautiful children, Johnny Mac. Um, you know, Little G. Little G and Johnny Mac kind of started it here in Victoria. Yeah. They were the first movement of hip hop and rap. Um, and I was, I am still very grateful to be part of that era as well. Um, yeah. Seeing how much music has paved the way for other artists. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see the dynamics shift and change because back in the day, like, what an Aboriginal rapper? Nah, we don't want a bar of you. <laughs> but now it's almost now it's cool to be Aboriginal. Well, not cool, but it's it's more accepted. It's promoted. Yes. It's actually it's easier to get your music circulated because of you know where the world is at the moment with being so progressive. Um, and I I remember even you know. Some of the greats, like Uncle Archie Roach, his CDs were always in the back of shops like JB Hi Five, always in the backs of like Sanity, under like global world music. Yeah. It wasn't sitting with the great Australian icons. No. Like, you know, Jimmy Barnes, it was it was always in the back. Um but now it's it's changed so drastically. Even even Gordon, um, Gordon, he he ended up he got called in personally by the American president at the time to do two shows on two separate occasions. Oh wow! If that was Kylie Minogue, we would have a holiday, or Danny Minogue or, you know, Delta Goodrum, if it was any other Australian icon, it would be known for miles on around, but not many people know that about Gormal. Not many people know that about Uncle Archie Brooch or Uncle Kutcher Edwards or, you know, Coloured Stone, the fact that they've actually been invited by some of, you know, the most prestige or even powerful people all around the world to perform on their behalf. It's it's amazing. And um I am glad to see that now it's starting to be more acknowledged. You know, um we're not 
the enemies in the music industry anymore were almost being invited to the table to sit amongst our, our beautiful, talented counterparts and, and work together, which is it's amazing to see. Besides rap, what other music style do you like? I try to be very versatile. So, yeah. and I've worked with so many other people that I've, I've had to be so versatile. Um, I've worked with a lot of the uncles, a lot of the aunties, elders, young kids, um, and I've dabbled in genres like funk, disco, hip-hop, R&B, soul, gospel, um, pop, indie, folk. I, I do love to stay versatile because it's, it's a form of growth as an artist, as a songwriter to be able to jump in and out of different genres. And over the years, I, I feel like I've become a lot more confident in my ability to do so. Yeah. Yeah. And there's another side of you that people won't know about, and that's the, the stuff you've done for community as well, like the yeah. Aboriginal community. That yeah. It's... And- it's good to see kind of community give back as well. Um, not, sometimes they don't necessarily remember what you've done or since then they've been through different managers. And yeah. they, um, but, for example, doing fundraising events for the Aboriginal Health Service was great doing fundraising events for three CR fundraising events for Aboriginal burial services fundraisers for deaths in custody fundraisers for NAIDOC events fundraisers for um, Yapra fundraisers for VACA um, and just keeping connected through music with community has always been a blessing um, and. There's been times that they've returned the favour or helped me out of a really sticky situation. So it's it's good when you can see something been given back, you know, and even if it's to you or one of your relatives or, or family members or even friends that just needed that extra support, it's, it's good to know that that's all being met, you know. As that saying go, pay it forward. Yeah. What's, your, what's yeah. your plans for the rest of the year? Um, definitely want to get back into music. Um, back into music, like I didn't just release a big thing <laughs> six, six weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been out of the game for a bit um, because my beautiful boy, Ronan, who's four, um, two years ago he was formally diagnosed with level three autism, which is the the most severe form of autism. You've got level one that's it's it can be noticeable every now and then, but for the most part, you know they're going to grow up and be self sufficient and quite independent. You've got level two where some of the behaviors might be a little bit obvious. They might struggle in social settings or picking up on social cues. But for the most part, they will still be quite, you know, self-sufficient, well-rounded, independent adults um, who can, you know, use jail facilities by themselves, independent enough to be able to go shopping on their own, things along those lines, can still hold a decent conversation. But then you've got level three, which is what my son is, who's also non-verbal, and that's where you see a huge difference and a huge shift in their development and what they are and aren't capable of. And it's it, it can feel like a, a nightmare at times um, because it's just you don't know what the future holds. And for the most part, a lot of kids that are level three severely autistic they need constant care for their entire life. Um, they can't shower independently. They can't go to the toilet independently. Um, they would not 
be able to survive in the outside world without that constant support and help. And that, as a parent, can be devastating. Um, so he was formally diagnosed two years ago with, yeah, um, the autism, level three, global development delay, which is kind of like um, intellectual disability yeah. and sleep insomnia, um, which would explain the countless nights of no sleep. Um, yeah. So for the first four years I managed to soldier on, I was going to work every day with about anywhere between 45 minutes. Sometimes if I was lucky, three hours sleep in my system, um, doing that five days a week, back to back to back for an extended period of time, a chronic sleep deprivation for almost four years straight. Um, it's it's enough to render anyone mm. in a severe burnout or just complete helplessness. So the last couple of years have definitely been a challenge. Um, I've always managed to make the impossible possible. I am as resilient as the day is long. I have survived so many different forms of abuse and trauma um, that I just keep coming back for more. It's just that's how I'm programmed. I don't usually stay down for long. Um, I get back up, keep soldiering on. But yeah. when it's something so personal, it, it can be a bit tricky. But I guess we're finally at a good point. We're putting all the things in place for my son to um, develop as best he can to be the best potential adult um, and hopefully gain some independence because it's all based on quality of life at the end of the day, and I want to make sure, me as a parent, I can do everything in my power to make sure my son has the best chance and best opportunities in life. Um, so, yeah, we are seeing a, a physiotherapist. We are seeing an occupational therapist. We're starting to um, hopefully see a speech pathologist soon. We're just on the waiting list. Um, and he's started his first day at school yesterday, a special oh, development school. How did it go? Yeah, I, I was in the midst of a, a little bit of an emotional breakdown. I was just... I was more harder for you than him. <laughs> he handled it like it was just a walk in the park. He, he <laughs> to that room like he owned it. Yeah. And he just... It was perfect. It, there wasn't too many sensory things. It was just enough. He had a lot of sensory toys all around him. He had a trampoline in the middle of the room, um, along with like a, a gymnasium form of equipment, um, puzzles, things he, he really just loves to play with. Um, yeah. And there's only two other students besides him in this classroom, and there's two educators, which means – He's definitely going to get more of that one-on-one -on -one therapy because um, yeah. in mainstream it just it wasn't possible. Um, some of the educators from the mainstream places they just I hate to say it, but it was almost like he was a lost cause. Yeah. He's like, yeah. Oof, I'm out. Was like a, yeah, like he was like a thousand-piece puzzle that you're trying to put together and you're only managing to get maybe three or four pieces of the border there and you're going in blind. You don't have the picture to reference. You know, he doesn't come with a manual or what to do. So it got to the point where sometimes, and not just at one daycare, this happened at numerous daycares, um, I would leave him at one place. Seven, eight hours later when I go to collect him, he's in the same spot. Um, by himself and it's it's heartbreaking to kind of know that that could potentially be what his life looks like yeah for the rest of you know into his adult years um so it was 
it was amazing to see him actually feel comfortable to mm. walk in this room and actually really explore it and pick up things and, and wanting to learn more. And yeah, so it was it was a really good start. Um because he does suffer from yeah, he, like we were just over the moon of celebrating. <laughs> He took the room like you take the stage. Yeah, exactly. He was home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's um, beautiful. Yeah. How many days a week does he go there? Is he going? So he'll start four days a week for the next month and a half, and then he'll be full-time. He'll be good. Um, and we've got him on some sleeping medication, which is, for the most part, helping a lot. Um, my goal is to start work again full time because, as you know, as a parent, during this time of inflation, petrol costs, food, and all the prices going up, it's pretty hard to do um, as a single parent um, or just just a parent alone. Um, it's yeah, and you, you need know, the regular funny. income. Yeah, you need the regular income. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it's going to be good. Um, I'm actually not dreading the future anymore. I'm kind of looking forward to it. Um, yeah. So. Do you find being a mother That's again good. different than when you were the first time? Because you said your daughter's like 19, the next month, like before. That's big gap. Yeah, look, it definitely. And learning everything all over again i know they say it's like a bike and you don't really forget but the education system the milestones and just the whole way everything has kind of changed now it's it's very different um when lyric was born it was still partially reasonable to lay babies on their stomach to help them go to sleep. Um, try doing that today, <laughs> you know, DHHS might get involved. <laughs> it's, it's proven that is not how you, you know, relax or put babies to sleep thanks to SIDS. So, yeah, um, there's a lot more awareness about ADHD um asd um other development and just more red flags to kind of keep an eye out on um and then we had to learn how to do a lot of these things during lockdown as well so ronan was about two three months old when COVID hit and yeah it it was learning how to be a parent in complete isolation again. Um, and then when he was eight months and I noticed a huge change in everything, it almost happened overnight, um, it, it was really difficult um, to be so isolated and knowing yesterday it was three, four days ago, his son could speak five, six words. He was constantly alert. He would turn around when you said his name. He would follow you with eye contact. He was very, you know, um, socially and environmentally aware to all of a sudden him sitting there staring at the light and rocking back and forth and, and flapping his hands or you know like it it was a huge change in him so quickly it 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 was almost like he was a different child um so to then be isolated through that whole process and trying to pull back the child that you had before that was engaged constantly and would respond to his name and would try and talk to you and, and babble and do everything, you know, meeting all of the milestones to 
sitting there and feeling like your son almost looks partially possessed and you're by yourself in this. And everyone you call, they haven't actually seen it for themselves. So they're just saying you're going crazy, you're being paranoid, he's fine. And that's basically the response I got for almost nine, ten months straight. You just started thinking it, you're overplaying it. That's like you just haven't seen him in the last year. But you will know the second you do, the the shift is just huge. So um, I guess I've been working on a lot of healing as well through my music and my art. Um, it's amazing how those two tend to go hand in hand. I, I've learned to kind of trick my brain whenever I'm struggling with songwriter's block or writer's block. I'll dabble with my art and all of a sudden the words just flood back to me and and basically write themselves on the page and vice versa if I'm struggling to become artistically creative and and sort of picture the vision and translate that onto the canvas, I'll go and write a song and then, you know, next minute canvas itself has come alive and it's just, you know, radiating all these beautiful bright colours. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I've kind of learnt through a lot of my work um, in, in the social work field how things, you know, can kind of pan out um, and the importance of understanding a bit of that trauma and depression and, yeah, things along those lines. So, Another question yeah. for you. There's a lot of young people that want to get into music and want to get in, want to do art. What what? Where should they start or what advice would you give them? Um, the landscape, unfortunately, had changed a bit since COVID. Um, before that, I was the go-to person. I knew where all the latest recording equipment and studios were. I knew where all the producers were. Um, I I'm, had contacts for days um, and same with the art scene, but... Since then, um, trying to navigate my way back into it. Um, and this is where the younger generation benefit a lot more because they're tech savvy and everything is based on technology. So they, you know, now there's nothing stopping them from going into JB High Five or, you know, any music shop, being able to network buy the right equipment, set up their own home studio, depending on what sort of fundings or connections they have, I would highly recommend going to Songlines or reaching out to Songlines. Um, Songlines, it's grassroots community organisation. Never turn anyone away. That's one thing I love. Um, No matter how persistent and annoying you may be, and I know because I'm one of them, <laughs> but they, um, for the most part, they, they're they there to help. And, yes, yeah, so they're currently based in Footscray. They had moved from the Preston location. Oh, years ago. They, now they were in Preston before, weren't they? Yeah, so they were sharing a building with 3K and D. Yes, upstairs and 3KD was downstairs yeah. it worked beautifully because it's like you finish recording a song and then you can get it played on the radio 10 minutes later like and do an interview like it was it was the perfect setup and being in Preston it was I think it was a lot easier for people to get to and fro on transport uh, yeah. it's great it, it is an amazing space um, but it's just kind of navigating a little bit on public transport. If you've got a car, you're fine. Um, if you've got family or friends with cars, you're also fine. Um, it's just, yeah, a little bit of hop, skipping a jump away with public transport. But um, And even then, they'll be able to give you a bit of a layout and understanding of what other networks and supports around your local area. So definitely hit someone's up um, regarding art. Um, I know 
I'm just thinking now. Um, I think your best bet would probably be contact even the Corey Heritage Trust or the Aboriginal Health Service just to see what other services and networks are around your area. Um, yeah, because a lot of the art stuff that I'd, I'd done was more in the the men's and women's prisons. Yeah. So, yeah, different layout, but... Yeah, just as equally rewarding. Um, I guess it's a good thing with us black fellas is it's always with that grapevine, you know. Yeah. Um, you always... know. Sorry, yeah. I said, who, yeah, who you know, and and how far we, how fast we can get to that, yeah. uh, that contact quickly. Yeah, exactly. And um, it was one of the things that it was. It was a blessing and a curse at the same time because it was almost like being in a small country town. Um, yeah. You know, your aunties or uncles knew you did something wrong even before you got the chance to tell your siblings. So <laughs> <laughs> even before you got the chance to come up with the alibi, you were already yeah. caught. <laughs> yeah. I've got one final question to ask you, and that is what was it like to hear your song on the radio for the first time i hated it really um yeah um because it's so different when you so as you grow up you have this preconception of what your voice actually sounds like you don't hear it in the technical sense of when you put the headphones on and they're tuning out all of the sound and noise and they've made it so your vocals are quite condensed it's the main thing that stands out so it's almost like it sounds like you but almost like the worst version of yourself and i see it happen all the time when we run music workshops with with younger children or, or even teenagers um and sometimes adults that have never been in a studio before because they're, they're like, that's is that me? Is that how I sound? So it's you really got to learn to kind of manipulate your voice in a way that you want to hear yourself back. So, I yeah, I was a typical teenager going in completely blind, didn't know anything about sound engineering or the equipment. Um, and hearing my first few recording takes and then hearing it being played on 3CR was like, I sound like a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> I sound like a little 12-year-old boy. <laughs> but, um, as, as time goes on, you end up, you know, perfecting your craft and growing and, and being not just all right with how you sound but, falling in love with it yeah, and then growing that confidence. So it's, yeah, it's a time thing. It's a journey. But, yeah, um, now I, I hear my stuff and it's like, yeah, that sounded good. That sounded sweet. I like that that was edited out. I like that that sound tech put some extra emphasis on that or added a little bit more um, you know, uh, colourful sort of harmonies to my vocals here or, or turned the sound down a little bit there just to really make the point pop, what I was saying. You know, like it's it's amazing how far I've personally come. Yeah. Yeah. And then there are times where it's like, you know what, I could have done that take a lot better. Um, I could have had more energy. I could have... Um, you know, done some extra ad libs or verbs over things, or I could have done a harmony here, or I could have put that there. But it's all just something that you kind of grow and, and develop and take notes. And if you're really hardcore perfectionist, like sometimes I can be, you'll redo the whole track until you are satisfied. And then there's other times where it's like, you know what, 
I'm glad that I read that song and it served a purpose in the moment, but it's not something I feel like I will be revisiting in the next 10 or 20 years. So I'm happy to leave it the way it is, even though I can hear little faults here and there or I could have done better here and this, but I'm at peace with it. I, I feel like it's it's definitely served its purpose for its time and I'm happy to still release it into the universe. So, yeah. Look, I'll, I'm just watching the time and I know that we have to go, but I want to say thank you very much for hanging with me, for yarning with me. You know, I, I think you're one of the most resilient, beautiful people I've I've ever met. You know, I love you so much. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, and I just want, I've, I've, I was trying to work out how long I've known you for. It's probably been about 10, 10 11 years, I think. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time I met you, you were doing uh, first aid trauma training. Yes. And yeah, yeah because of your amazing knowledge and wisdom and guidance, you did actually help me save a life. So I'm eternally grateful for you so thank you my brother because that individual is still around today and is kicking goals so that's yeah. good to hear that's good to hear so guys i want to say thank you for our podcast i want to say thank you to mariki miss hood and thanks guys see you at the next podcast